you guys turn around and welcome each other? Be seated. Uh, Skip passes, you guys. Would you stand and worship with us again? i 
soon dissolve like snow and the sun forbear to shine but God who called me here below will be forever mine will be forever so many different messages in it. Uh, it's called It'll Come to the Altar, and, you know, as I was kind of going through this week and playing and listening to some of the stuff that we were going to sing on this one, you know, I realized that we live in a really broken world, but at the end of the day, and even throughout the day, there's always a place we can go, and like the Course says, if we just come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, and He bought forgiveness with His precious blood. So as we sing through this next song, really... Contemplate the meaning to this song.
may be seated. All right, all you teenagers are dismissed at this time. All teenagers, you're dismissed for class, for upstairs. <clears throat> if you're a teen this morning, follow Chris. He won't lead you astray. I want to invite your attention this morning to the book of Matthew, chapter 13. We're going to be turning to several passages of Scripture, but it would be good for you to start in Matthew 13, so you're not trying to find it um, a little bit later. <clears throat> Matthew 13. We are in a series called, Can a Christian Lose Their Salvation? Now, I hope and pray that you guys are enjoying, uh, I, sh I should use that term, enjoying this series. Like, um, I hope you're learning from this series. Um, I, I'm enjoying preaching it. Um, I'm enjoying the study that I'm getting out of it. Um, God has stretched me so much and taught me so much and, and uh, I'm just glad that I can bring this to you. I, I think it's detrimental, not detrimental, I always use that word wrong. I think it's very important that we all understand can a Christian lose their salvation. Um, through scripture that I've been teaching, um, we all see that the Bible declares that a person cannot lose their salvation who is truly born again. But with that, we've been looking at two arguments, and that, those two arguments are, if a person can't lose their salvation, then are you saying that that gives them the green light to then go live how they want and sin and just live their life since they'll never lose their salvation it's almost like a get-out-of-jail-free card. They can just live however they want, and, and they can never lose it. I'm going to be answering that question next Sunday, which will be then the last message of the series. Today, I'm answering the rest of the question that we've been asking, and that is, if a Christian cannot lose their salvation, then how do you explain the many people that are just walking away from the faith? Last week we looked at uh, Josh Harris. Um, some of you know him, the author who wrote I Kissed Dating Goodbye and I Kissed Dating the Church Goodbye. He was a pastor of a mega church, a husband, best known author, best selling author, should I say. And yet he walked away from it all, walked away from his wife, walked away from his church, walked away from following Christ. He, he no longer says he's a Christian. And now, and I gave you several illustrations of people that I knew that have walked away, and I know that there's some of you here that probably know of somebody who's walked away. And how do we answer for that? How does this happen? Why does this happen? And just last week um, in my studies, I also learned because of Joshua Harris saying that he's no longer a Christian, the lead singer of Hillsong, Marty Sampson has now said that his faith is on shaky ground. He first denounced his Christianity in a Instagram text message post, um, but then later, after being spoken to about it, then changed it and said, my faith is on shaky ground. Now I'll just say, first of all, um, you know... As believers, you have to be careful not to get your theology from people in the Christian industry. You should make sure you get your theology from the Word of God. Because this does not change, right? This does not change. But still, learning of Marty Sampson and and trying to figure out, okay, so why did this happen? Because this really shakes Christians. This really makes us all kind of like, wait a minute, what's going on? Why are these people doing this? Well, what they're doing is what the Bible has declared for uh, hundreds and hundreds of years, and it's what the Bible declares as apostasy, apostasy. What is 
apostasy. Literally, apostasy is denouncing a religion. It's a walking away from truth. And that's what people do. Now, the question comes up, well, are people who are, and we would call them apostates, are they saved or are they, were they never believers? Well, I think we need to understand, and I'll touch more on that here in just a little bit, but you need to understand, remember in John 6 that we went verse by verse, and if you want to see that, I'd encourage you to, um, I've got to get it loaded on the website, so don't go to the website, go to YouTube and type in Lighthouse Bible Church Topeka, and you'll see that sermon. Um, you need to go back and listen to this and, and follow along verse by verse, because we learned last week that not everyone who is a part of Christianity is truly a Christian. Remember in John 6 where Jesus said, I am the bread of life, you must come to me, you must believe in me, you know, and he uses those phrases, you must eat my flesh, drink of my blood, and if you don't, you have no part with me, you have no life in you. And remember Jesus said twice that the people in John 6, there was many of his disciples that they did not believe and then in verse 66, it says, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. They quit. They, they walked away. They committed apostasy. They heard the truth, but they walked away from the truth. And that's when Jesus, of course, looks to his other disciples and he asks them, do you also want to go away? And of course, Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. But in 69 is the key part. He said, also we have come to believe and know. We don't just know who you are. We believe, and notice he says, that you are the Christ. The word Christ means holy one of God. The son of the living God. You see, Jesus made it clear that not everyone who is a part of Christianity or a part of the Christian realm, if, you, if I can use that, and I'll just use the church, okay, this building. When we come to a service, not everyone who is a part of this is a Christian. And Jesus told us that everyone who is a part of the body of believers they are the ones who is really a believer, or they are, excuse me, Jesus told us that not, not everyone who is a part of the body of believers is not a believer. So in Matthew chapter 13, we see the first illustration, and that is the first example Jesus gives us is the seed and the sower. Notice in verse number one of Matthew 13. On the same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea, and great multitudes were gathered together to him so that he got into a boat and sat and the whole multitude stood on the shore. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. What is Jesus saying here? He gives the description in verse number 18. He begins to define and explain this parable. Jesus is talking about the seed, which is the word of God, and the four grounds, which is the human heart. And he talks about the seed that hits a human heart. Not all of it takes. But the last one that takes produces fruit. That's the, notice he says, good ground. But notice in verse 18, I'll let Jesus explain it himself. He says, therefore, hear the parable of the sower, verse 18. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart, this is he who received seed by the wayside. 
But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who received seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. But he who received the seed on the good ground is he who hears the word, understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some 100, some 60, and some 30. Understand that Jesus' whole deal here is to tell us who is the one who received the seed, he in which fruit was produced. That's Jesus' whole key here and his whole theme in, in the seed and the sower and the soils. Jesus even explained to us that there are going to be those who will hear the message and they're going, wow, that's a good idea. There are people who even hear it with joy, but will never believe it or trust it or embrace it. And therefore, the cares of the world or Satan snatches it away or there's no root in themselves because they never took it in. And so Jesus said, the last one on the good ground, they did. And the fruit is what produced from it. But notice with me in verse number 24, same text. Jesus gives another parable of the tares among the wheat. He says, another parable he put forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and wet his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? Now just as an illustration here or a comment here, if you um, look at this back in like manners and customs of Jewish times and you look up what tares are and what wheat is, um, tares and wheat look almost identical. When you look at a tear, which is a weed, and it grows up next to a wheat stalk, it looks almost identical to a wheat. But when wheat produces fruit, the tear does not. And that's when you distinguish the tear from the wheat. And here the disciple or the per servants are saying, wow, the wheat has now produced a crop. It's fruitful, but now we see tares among them. And the owner said an enemy has done this. The servants say, do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, no, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at the, end, and at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares, bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now notice in verse number 36, he gives the ex explanation of this parable. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came to him saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Both of these parables teach that there are believers and unbelievers in every church. There are those who truly know Christ and those who are just going through the motions. Wearing the label Christian does not guarantee a change of heart. 
It is possible to hear the word and even agree with its truth without taking it to heart. It is possible to attend church, serve in a ministry, and call yourself a Christian and still be unsaved. How is that possible? Because Jesus even stated right in these two parables, it's possible. Remember in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus even said, many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, did we not do this and that? And what is he going to say? He's going to say, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I never knew you. Remember, we gave you the illustration of Judas last week. Judas is a great example of someone who looked just like a Christian. He acted the part, looked the part, but he knew in himself he wasn't a Christian because the whole time he was plotting on what? Okay. Right. To go against Christ. To sell him out for 30 pieces of silver. And so that's exactly what he did. Jesus even stated in the Lord's, when they were having the Lord's Supper, right before that he said, one of you here is going to betray me. And he was speaking of Judas, and Judas knew who he was. He had already plotted it out. He had already knew that he was going to go to the Pharisees and say, what will you give me if I turn him over to you? And they gave him 30 pieces of silver for him to deny the Lord. But I think we can also sum this up in saying what Jesus made the statement in Mark 7, 6. He says, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. We need not be shaken because Joshua Harris left the faith. We need not to be shaken because uh, Marty Sampson walked away. We not, must not be shaken that there are multitudes of people who are in churches, who just one day, by the way, Marty Sampson just says, um, my faith is shaken uh, and I don't care. He said, I'm comfortable with that. And we not, need not as believers go, what, you know, what's going on? Jesus himself and also Paul, and I'll look at this here in just a moment, shows us that apostasy is real. People will walk away from the truth. We know that. Even Jesus stated in Matthew chapter 7, he said, broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in that way. He said, but narrow is the way that leads to life everlasting. And there are few who find it. Why? Because like, for instance, M Marty S Simpson said he's now under a new teaching that Jesus isn't the only way. So now he's, he's learned that there's other ways to God. Joshua Harris said Christians don't have the market on grace. You see what happens when you get away from the Word of God and you begin to listen to man and you start hearing their philosophies and their theories and their theology and it's not based out of the Word of God. Listen, we all have the Bible, right? If you don't have one, I'll get you one. There, this is, do you know that this is the most popular selling, the, the number one selling book in the world is the Bible? So, here, here's these guys that are listening to other people and, and all of a sudden they're, they're walking away. Why are they walking away? Because they're apostates. They're apostates. Jesus said it's going to happen. Remember the word apostasy means to abandon or renunciation of a religious or political belief. That's the actual definition. But in our... In, in, in the New Testament, matter of fact, turn with me to 2 Thessalonians. I'm going to have you turn to quite a bit of Scripture now, and I hope you have your Bible. If you don't, if you're new, please look to the person next to you and, and kind of look over, and, and, and they'll share. Um, at least I hope they will. Um, <laughs> look on their Bible, and, and if you're, you know your Bible really well, and there's somebody next to you that doesn't know it very well, would you kind of just put your finger on the passage so they can follow along? 
But look at Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. If you're taking notes, this is my second point. The warning of apostasy in the church. The warning of apostasy in the church. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, in verse 1, listen to who Paul is speaking to the church at Thessalonica, right? And he says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by the Spirit or by word or by letter as if from us as though the day of Christ had come. Now, he's talking about the end times. He's talking about the end times. So here Paul is saying, listen, don't be deceived. It hasn't happened yet, okay? Paul says, <laughs> I'm sure Paul probably would have said this, I'm still here, you're still here. Hasn't happened yet, right? But he says, don't be scared. Don't be shaken. You haven't missed it. But notice what he says. Verse 3, let no one deceive you by any means for that day. Now, it's the word day there probably in your text is capitalized. It's for end of the end times. Will not come unless, and here it is, the great apostasy. The falling away comes first. The falling away, walking away from Christ. The great apostasy. You say, Pastor, does that mean that there's going to be churches like one day all of a sudden everybody's just going to walk out? Well, let's look what the text says. He says, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin. For those of you who are Bible students, the man of sin is Satan, the Antichrist. The Antichrist talked about in the book of Daniel, talked about in Revelation. Talked about in Matthew 24, this Antichrist, a man who is indwelt by Satan. Remember, I don't want to go into detail. Remember, he's going to sign the peace treaty with Israel. And for seven years, it's going to be this treaty. But in the middle of that treaty, he's going to go back and put a statue in the new temple, which is the abomination of desolation. You'll have to read for that. And there's a series that I did on Revelation. Oh, I did that on Wednesdays, didn't I? I was going to say, go to YouTube. Um, uh, if you're interested, I'll give you my notes um, on that. I can print those out for you. I got them on my computer. So, um, But notice he said, Till the, sin, uh, the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, what he may be revealed in his own time? For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he, Holy Spirit, who now restrains, will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power. Listen, with all power. Why does he do this? Power, signs, and lying wonders. Why does the Antichrist do the signs and lying wonders? So that he may draw those who have never received the truth to fall away. For he shall with power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be, what class? Saved. Saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie that they all may be condemned, listen, who did not, what, church? Believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Paul the apostle told the church at Thessalonica, there's a great apostasy coming. We still see it today because there's apostates all the time. And by the way, 2019, I almost said 2020, <laughs> soon. We are in 2019. Okay, woo! Scared me there for a minute. 2019 isn't the only year that we've seen people walk away from Christ. It's been happening ever since Jesus was here on earth. It's been happening ever since. 
But here we see a warning of the apostasy that will happen in the church. Paul is writing to the church. And he said, there will be a great falling away when the son of perdition, the man of sin, the Antichrist, when he comes on the scene, there's going to be people that will follow his ways with signs and deception and wonders. He will draw them away. Why? Because it's easy to fall after someone else when you have not truly embraced Christ. Paul gave the statement right there. They will be condemned who did not believe the truth. They will not receive, they never received the love of the truth, verse 10, that they might be saved. 1 Timothy 4.1, Paul also told young Timothy, now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, apostasy, some will apostatize, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. That's exactly what Marty Sampson and Joshua Harris has done. Joshua Harris went to Canada and got under some weird teaching and came away going, wow, I'm not a Christian. Why? Because they give heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. The argument that arises with apostasy that I think many people ask is, were apostates ever born again believers? Those who apostatize, fall away, walk away, however you want to call it. Were they ever really born again? And that's the debate. That's really the big debate. Because there are some who believe that apostasy is those who are truly born again, but just one day decide, no, I'm walking away. But I think we also have to define that term in walking away is rejecting Jesus. And I want you to understand that what that entails, because we're going to look at this a little bit deeper here in just a second. Falling away, walking away, apostatizing, whenever you make the statement and say, Jesus is not the only way, you're not saying, I trust in Jesus and he is you know, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, but there's others that you can go to that will do the same thing that He can do. What you have done, you have rejected in who Jesus is. He is the Christ, the only Holy One that is able to perform and did perform or did give the sacrifice for us to be washed, renewed, forgiven, regenerated, born again. He is the only one that can do that. Amen. And when you turn somewhere else and you say, well, you have rejected Jesus. Now, some people would say, now wait a minute, isn't it okay to like still believe in him but say there's others? No, because you fully take away what only Jesus can do. And by the way, another message, what a great picture of grace for us that Jesus, the Holy One, would come down to sinful ones and die in our place Take on our sin and give us his righteousness. That's grace. That's grace that God would do that. Let me get back to my message. <laughs> we have to understand that apostates who walk away were never truly believers. We're already aware of this in John chapter 6 from Jesus' own words. You do not believe. Thessalonians. Paul said, you do not believe. But notice with me in 2 Timothy, chapter number 3. 2 Timothy 3, in verse number 1. <clears throat> I got two major texts I've got to go through, so please hang out with me. 2 Timothy, chapter 3, in verse 1. Notice what he says. 
But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good. Hey, there's no doubt, Tim, I, I get that. There's people like that today. We know them. They're unbelievers. They're people outside the church. They're people outside of Christ. We get that. Notice verse 4, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Got that, Tim? We know that. That's those people outside. That's those people who reject God, reject Christ. There's no doubt you can see that. Verse number 5, having a form of godliness. Having a form of godliness but denying its power. And from such people turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. See, these are people who Paul is saying, listen, they look like Christians, but their fruits Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders. They have a form of godliness, but they deny its power. The power of the gospel. Paul said, for it is the power of God unto salvation. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. And here he says they have a form of godliness. Those are those who are apostates. Look in 1 John chapter 2. Just a couple more, please, and I'll, I'll be done here in just a moment. 1 John chapter 2. Look with me in verse 18. This is really good. I, I mean, really good as in right here. The, <laughs> not what I'm saying. Hope you understood what I meant by that. This, the Word of God is good. This is 1 John 2, 18. Notice what he says. Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. We, we talked about that, right? We just learned about that. 2 Thessalonians, Antichrist, man of sin's coming, right? But notice what he says here. That the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists, have come. What? Now listen. By which we know that it is the last hour. Verse 19 is key. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, they walked away, they apostatized, that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. If you're born again, you have the Holy Spirit in you. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it. And that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar, but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. If you deny who Jesus is, you are apostatizing. Who is a liar, but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. He is antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. So if a person falls away, they're called antichrist. Verse 23, whoever denies the son does not have the father either. Listen, you need to understand this. Whoever denies the son does not have God. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. John, I love John. Matter of fact, when, when people get saved, the first thing I say, you know what you need to do? You need to read the Gospel of John. Because the Gospel of, he's just so easy, right? 
You know, Paul is really hard. You get into Romans, you know, and boy, he uses some language that you're like, what is, I don't, you know. But John, I mean, John is just so simple to understand, isn't he? Even a caveman could do it. I mean, even, <laughs> I just had to throw that in there. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Verse 24, therefore let that abide in you, which you heard from the beginning. If that what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that He has promised us. What? Eternal life. Eternal life. Eternal life. Now, I'm going to get to the end of my message by giving a warning to those of you who may know the truth, but have never, as we said in John 6, received it, believed it, embraced it, trusted in it. You know, You've heard me speak on salvation, the gospel message. You've heard me preach on this over and over and over. And yet you know the truth, but you've never taken it in. Why? There's several reasons why people don't take in the truth. One, because sometimes pride is such a sneaky little thing. And sometimes pride can come in and we go, and, and, and this is, they don't use this expression, but inside they do and they go, well... I know what you're saying, preacher, but I believe. See, a lot of people will hang on to so many things. Some people hang on to a denomination. Now, we've got people here from Catholic to Baptist to Lutheran to Methodist to the Church of God to, I don't know if I didn't name you, <laughs> that you came from those churches and came here to Lighthouse. And what you have to understand is your denomination, whatever you come from, I'm from Baptist. My denomination doesn't determine my salvation. Right? Because I've been to all of them before I was saved. I mean, I've been to the Catholic Church, the Lutheran Church, the Church of God, to all the Nazarene, and I went to all of them because I wanted to make sure I was safe, you know. Because <laughs> when I get to heaven one day and Jesus goes, why should I let you in? Because I belong, you know. But that's not going to work, right? Because denominations don't get us into heaven. It's only the blood of Jesus Christ. And so therefore, some people will just go, I know what you're saying, and they just keep holding on to that little bit of, well, I've got my own way. I've got my own thing. And so therefore... Many times, as Paul said, the devil of this world, is the, the prince of this world has blinded the eyes so that they may not see. And yet I also believe the Holy Spirit's knocking at the door. And he's showing you truth that you must receive. And it's not, again, this isn't coming from Tim Wilson. This is coming straight from the Word of God. And so, let me give you a warning. This is the last part. The warning of walking away. Hebrews chapter number 6. Hebrews chapter number 6. Turn there with me. <clears throat> Hebrews 6. And verse... I'm going to start in verse number... Um, I'm going to start in verse number 5. Hang with me. I've got to get these two verses. Just give me a few more minutes. And I know it's getting late, but... Um, Hang out with me just for a moment because this is really important. The two most popular scriptures that teach about apostasy and yet these two scriptures I will say are probably the most difficult scriptures in all Bible to interpret. Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10. These two passages of scripture have been debated, 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 debated and will continue to be debated until Jesus comes. What are these texts really saying? Because people will say, see, it is possible for a person to lose their salvation. They can lose their, a born-again believer can lose their salvation by walking away. Now, let's look at the text. Because I believe that everything, first of all, you can never take a passage of Scripture or a few verses and take them out of context and say, this is why I believe. That's like, you know, when the Pentecostals or 
Um, those who believe in the Word of Faith movement, you know, they take this passage of Scripture out of the Old Testament that says that your words have life. They said life and death, Proverbs says, in the power of the tongue. And so you guys got, got guys like Creflo Dollar and others that will say, see, you speak wealth into existence. Wallet, you are filled with money. That's what they teach. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Jesse Duplantis even has said, and I did a series on that. And I even showed the clips of them saying it. Jesse Duplantis even said, you determine your death. You decide when you're going to die. Because the Bible says death and life are in the power of the tongue. Listen, such a gross interpretation of the word of God. Encouragement and destruction tearing down are in the power of the tongue. You can encourage someone or tearing them down by what you say. But make no mistake about it, you cannot create from nothing by the words you say. Uh, another message. Let's get back here. Hebrews 6. Starting in verse 5. And you've got to understand, context of Hebrews. The writer is speaking to Jewish Hebrew Christians. That's who he's writing to. You study the book of Hebrews, and really, it doesn't take hard study, but just to read it through, you can constantly see the writer is constantly saying this. I'm going to paraphrase. Christians, listen to me. Those of you who are believers, those of you that are on the fence, you've never embraced Jesus, but you're on the fence, and those who totally reject Christ, you need to listen to me. The Old Testament, the old way, the old sacrifices, all that, the temple, all that is over with now, Jesus is the one you must trust in for eternal life. You cannot go back to the shadow. You cannot go back to the old way of life. You must go forward to Christ. You turn, and we'll read of this, of course, but that's what the writer constantly is saying to these people. Don't quit going back to Judaism and move to Christ. Verse 5 of chapter 5 so also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Of whom we have much to say and hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. Dull of hearing, person who hears something over and over, you're trying to teach them. You ever try to teach somebody something and they're just like, Whew. you say, I got kids, I know. <laughs> For the, now notice what he says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. Milk is... The basics of Christianity, the basics of the word, solid food is the deep stuff, theological deep. We all need to get into the deep stuff. That's what the writer, I'm going to say, is Paul. He's, that's what he's doing. He's like, we, you need to get deeper now. You're, you're still in the wading pool with the little children. You're, you're, the water is just up to your ankles. You need to get out of the six foot of water and get out there in the deep. Verse 13, for everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. 
When you get deep into the Word of God, you understand apostasy. When you get deep into the Word of God, you understand the security of the believer. When you get in deep into the Word of God, you understand that salvation is by Christ alone and faith alone, uh, by faith alone, through Christ alone, by grace. When you get in deep in the Word of God, you understand things that if you were still a babe, you'd just go, I don't get it. You must go deeper. Verse, six, or verse 1 of chapter 6. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, we've told you who he is. He is the Son of God. He is the High Priest. When he died on the cross, the temple veil ripped from top to bottom. He made access for us to go directly to the Father. He is the one we must look at. Therefore, let's leave the elementary principles of Christ. Let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God and the doctrine of baptism, laying out of hands and the resurrection of dead and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. What is the writer saying? Grow up. Move forward. Notice what he says. Verse 4. For it is impossible. It's impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come stop. You see now, that text right there explains and defines a believer. But does it really? For the writer said, those who were once enlightened to come to know truth and have tasted the heavenly gift. What? The miracles, the what? what happens in church and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, seeing what the Holy Spirit can do and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, all of this that can be experienced in a church setting. You know, it's funny, and just on a side note, I'll just say this, this is just for, because I believe this. You know, 99.9% .9 of the theologians believe Paul wrote this. And yet, in this, no words are used that Paul would normally use for someone who was saved. Justified, elect, saved, chosen. None of those words Paul ever uses, or this writer never uses, if this is Paul. Notice what he says, verse 6, if they fall away. They'll fall away means to apostatize, to turn away. Now notice what they do to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put Him to an open shame. Remember, he's writing to Hebrew Jews who are going back to Judaism that keep going, I don't know if he's the only way. It's like, you know, the blood sacrifices, you know, we, we, you know, we were taught that we got to do this once a year and all these, you know, get the holiest of holies, all this. We got to go back. Listen, the writer is saying, no, Jesus is the only way. If you fall back, if you apostatize, you are crucifying again the Son of God and putting Him to an open shape. You Hebrews who your forefathers, those who are for you, crucified Jesus, you're going to do it again because what you're doing when you fall away, you're totally rejecting who Jesus is. You are re what you're saying when you fall away, when you turn away from Jesus, you're saying he's not the Holy One of Christ. He's not God's only son. He is not the only way to heaven. What he did on the cross, he was just an ordinary man who died a cruel death. So what? That's what he did. He is not who he said he was. That's what you're saying. Notice what he says, verse 7. This is key. Now remember, the writer's saying grow up. You're, eating, you're drinking milk. You ought to be eating meat. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessings from God. 
But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. What is he given? Two illustrations of people. Those who produce fruit and those who don't. You need to grow up and produce fruit. If you don't turn to Christ, get away from Judaism, stop going back to the Old Testament ways of sacrifice, get away from Judaism, totally embrace, receive Christ, and produce that fruit, you are just like that which bears thorns and briars. It's rejected. It's cursed. Its end is to be burned. That's what he's saying. It's very simple. Notice verse 9, but beloved, we, <laughs> we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation. What is it that accompanies salvation? Though we speak in this matter, here they are. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, and that you have administered to the saints and do minister. There's the fruit. That's why the writer said, hey, we know or are confident of better things concerning you. You're not that which produces briars and thorns. You are not those who are riding the fence. You have embraced Christ. You have received Christ. For God is not unjust to forget your work and all that. In verse 11, and we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end that you do not become sluggish. But imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Is he who he speaks of here in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6, believers? I believe there's three types of people that he's speaking of. Full believers, those who are riding the fence, and those who are unbelievers. And I like that where he says in verses 4 through 6, he, he talks about those and they... But in verse 1, he says, let us, we, in verse 9, he separates the two. And when you look at verse number 7, according to the fruits, Jesus even talked about that. I believe these people were apostates that fall away. It's impossible. Why? It's impossible to renew them to repentance. Why? Because they have rejected Christ. If you don't think that Jesus is the only way, there's no way for you to be saved. No way. And you say, preacher, that's hard and that's tough. In our day and age, and it's like in 2019, people just don't say that. You're so exclusive. I'm not exclusive. Jesus is exclusive. Am I saying the right word or inclusive, exclusive? He's the only way. Am I saying the right word? I don't know if I am. He is the only way. Hebrews 10, I, I know, I know, it's 10 till. Hebrews 10, really fast. Hebrews 10, really quick. Hebrews 10, verse 26. This is key. This will be the last scripture we go to. We'll close our Bibles right after this and we'll have an invitation and we can all go experience the baptism and then go to Denny's. <laughs> Who goes to Denny's? No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Hey, they got good stuff. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. By the way, uh, let me skip that. Let me just get right in. If we sin willfully, stop. Now, it's tempting to read this text and go, okay, if we sin, we lose our salvation. Let me ask you a question. How many of you do not sin willfully? Nobody? Nobody? How many here do not sin? Uh, let me count. None. All of you sin, right? And when we do sin, we sin willfully. You say, I, I didn't mean to do it. Yes, you did. <laughs> hey, we all do, right? For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice of sins. Sinning willfully. Go back. Go, oh, gosh. Hebrews 10 alone. Oh, man. Uh, 
verse 1, for the law having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect. Verse 4, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Verse 10, by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Verse 14, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Again, Jesus is it. Get away from Judaism. Quit going back. If we sin willfully, that willful sin is rejection of Christ. That willful sin is turning. If you know the truth, you've received the knowledge of salvation, and you go, but Tim, listen, <laughs> I know people who say, I don't care what people say. What does the Bible say? Quit listening to other people and listen to the Word of God. I know that's too much. That's tough. But the writer clearly states, sinning willfully is rejection of Christ. It's apostatizing. It's, 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 it's turning away. You know the truth, but you go, nah, just, I, I'm not there. There no longer remains a sacrifice of sins because there is no other sacrifice that can happen for you to be forgiven. Nothing. Notice verse 27, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who, is, who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. That's what happened. You reject Moses' law, you were put to death. Notice verse 29, of how much more punishment or how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace. If Christ sanctifies us and, and the Holy Spirit is to come into us and you say, no, I don't believe all that. And you, are, look at what you're doing. You're, you're just, you're stomping on Christ. You're saying it meant nothing, him dying on the cross. He was nobody. It meant nothing. Verse 30, for we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. Verse 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Do we who are believers have to fear to fall into the hands of the living God? Do we as believers who have embraced the truth, have put our trust and belief in Jesus Christ, do we have a fear of standing before the great white throne judgment, the judgment of God in which his wrath will be? Do we have a fear of that? No. Why? Because we are no longer under the wrath of God. Why? Because Romans 5, 1, and all who are in Christ Jesus, all, who, I'm paraphrasing here, you can read it for yourself, Romans 5, 1, all who have embraced Christ, believed in Christ, received Christ, trusted in Christ, we are justified, no longer under the wrath of God. That's why we have that assurance we will not be judged like the adversaries. We will not stand and, 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 and be cast into the lake of fire. Why? Because we have believed the truth. Not just known it, but we've embraced it. Jesus Christ is the only one. The only Son of God. The, the only <clears throat> Holy One the only redeemer, the only sacrifice, the only way to the Father. He's the only way. Have you trusted in Christ?